Hello and welcome to the New Culture Forum's brand new in-house show with me, Emma Webb, the director of NCF, mm. Peter Whittle, and Mark Sidwell, the author of The Long March. This week, we're going to be talking about all of the big stories in the news, including our first story, which is this anti-Semitism scandal that has unfolded uh, around Whoopi Goldberg. I believe that we have the clip of that, so let's take a look at that first. The Holocaust isn't about race. No. No, it's well, not about maybe race. It is. Yeah, it's, no, considered... it's about man's inhumanity to man. But these are two Romans. white groups of people. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And I think in a moment like this, you really see how far we've come. I mean, obviously this is, this is America, which is different uh, racial debate and, and anti-Semitism debate to the one that you get in the UK. But just to see a major, a major figure on the news uh, in, in the American public scene, just openly talking in that way about about uh, the Holocaust and about the Jewish people as if that wasn't a racial issue. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be framed in this particular way uh, around the, uh, the race debate uh, in America. It just seems like something that even five, ten years ago wouldn't have been that way. Yeah, I, isn't this all down, down to critical race theory, mm -hmm. actually? You see things totally in terms of black and white, quite literally. I mean, I think, you know, her remarks, she went on then to say, things such as uh, like this was just a fight between two bunch of white people mm -hmm. or something now you know I, I, I isn't it the case that a white celebrity would have been cancelled for about a tenth of what she said straight away destroyed not not just a white celebrity but this was a point that I don't know if you saw Ben Shapiro's tweet pointing out that if she had at any point in her career S suggested that she had any sympathy with any kind of conservative cause that yeah. this would have been the end of her career as well so yeah. he was making a point about the fact that we've got these double standards towards the the an anti-racist supposedly anti-racist yeah. yeah. people yeah. on the left i mean we should say i think she has been taken off the show but perhaps uh, only for two weeks two though. weeks right this is two weeks to be re-educated or rather to reflect on her remarks and all this i mean you you could say i mean the whole point about free speech surely is and we've said this ourselves, that you have to take the good with the bad. So, you know, she, I guess, in theoretically, she should be allowed to say what she likes. But at the same time, uh, you know, good ideas should come up and defeat those sort of bad ideas. But really, it was the level of ignorance mm -hmm. that I found astounding. Well, well the way I mean, she, she doubled down as well, didn't yeah. she? Because she did, she did a chat show afterwards, sort of semi-defending yeah. herself. Which yeah. And the, the lack of self-awareness as yeah. well. She didn't seem to, to, you would think, I mean, anybody watching that would have cringed themselves into oblivion yeah. at just how absolutely horrifying it was. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you saw that in, in Spiked, mm. Brendan O'Neill mm. wrote this really interesting article about Marcus Rashford. And Marcus Rashford, and another uh, popular footballer, I don't know very much about football, had their photograph taken recently in Dubai with the rapper Wiley. Mm. And Wiley has also been exposed for making anti-Semitic comments, like quite wild mm. ones, mm. suggesting mm. that Jews are snakes and cowards. Mm. Um, he believes that they're satanic in some way. Um, and they had their photograph taken with him. And, and the point that Brendan O'Neill was making was that if these were you know, individuals who, you know, were, were not you know, of the sort of stripes that they are, that they would have been completely, you know, that, that it would have been oh, yeah, all over yeah. the news. But, I mean, it's not, it's not just the inconsistency that troubles me, though. I mean, uh, it's always a, a bad thing, but I think just the way that anti-Semitism, or at least remarks that are critical of, of Jews in slightly conspiratorial ways, have become more mainstream, more acceptable yeah. in a way yeah. that would have been mm -hmm. unthinkable when I was growing up and at school, even at a time when things like Holocaust education seemed to have grown and be taken more seriously. It seems behind that sort of superficial yeah. thing, there's, going, there's a real sea change. Going yeah. back to what you were saying about yeah. um, Whoopi Goldberg saying that this is, you know, between white people, yeah. that it's almost as if in, within this critical race theory mm. structure, that the Jews are almost viewed as being almost hyper white, hyper privileged. Never mind the actual history of the Jewish yeah. people. Isn't and that so the on. biggest irony of all? That mm. The people who suffered the Holocaust are somehow not accorded, you know, they they accorded privilege. They're not accorded this victim status, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in, in this hierarchy. It's extraordinary. But again, this yeah. is this is was a point that was made by Brendan O'Neill is that because of the and perhaps it's because 
people are blinded by critical race theory, that we don't talk about um, anti-Semitism in the black community, we don't talk about anti-Semitism in the Muslim community because people are afraid of being called racist or Islamophobic if they, well, I mean, if they challenge it. Yeah, I, mean, I don't mean to, to hold this one, but I mean, what I find, you know, we sort of see articles about what is happening in the UK, why, you know, why is there this growth in anti-Semitism? And no one addresses who is doing this, right? Well, there was, there was the recent uh, incident with the, the bus and the BBC yeah. was getting into some, in some, getting some flack for not covering it, it yeah. properly mm -hmm. or, or suggesting that maybe that they were sort of spurring them on. Was this yeah. the attack on t two Jewish men? Yes. No, no, no yes, yeah. uh, but the one on the bus, on, the bus, yeah. on mm -hmm. Oxford Street, was yeah, a, I think the, the BBC suggested that somehow they had been provoked into doing this, as though that would make it okay. Mm. Uh, but the fact is, it's no, you know, I think it's a terrible slander, because I think this country's always been remarkably, you know, good on, in terms of anti-Semitism. I, you say, growing up, I, you know, apart from the kind of, you know, admittedly there was always casual racism growing up, there's mm -hmm. no question. But, I mean, there's never been a massive sort of sense of that in this country. Mm -hmm. Not like in Europe, not like in France or Germany. And yet somehow you read these articles now saying, oh, this is on the rise. What's happening to us? You say, well, actually, is it us? What, what do you mean by us? But even the fact I had to ask which incident you were referring mm. yes. to. Because I remember back when I was at university and I was studying, and I studied for a time at Leo Beck, which is a, a sort of rabbinical training college, mm. And they had so much security because there, obviously there yeah. has always been a threat. But I don't remember a time when you would be in a conversation like this having mm. to ask, mm. oh, which violent attack in the mm. news mm. against Jewish people mm. are you referring to? Mm. I think, you know, it, going back to Whoopi Goldberg, it'll be interesting to see actually what happens. You know, I mean, will she be back? Because a lot of this is down to also to commercial value, you know, I mean, it's, you know, is she really worth everything to The View, which is the program she co-hosts, things like that. Um, and uh, which is a terrible consideration, but that's the kind of thing they'll be thinking of. Um, but I just thought it was the level of kind of boneheaded ignorance, you know, of actual history, the mm -hmm. absolute illiteracy historically. I just thought it was astounding. It was you know? interesting that we often hear about misinformation, Holocaust denial mm. and that kind of thing. Nobody really ever talks about how, as you were saying, critical race theory, but some of these ideologies are bending and distorting the way that we the prism through which we view history yeah, yeah. and in the process you, you you just do end up with the sorts of views that Whoopi Goldberg is expressing mm -hmm. here the mm -hmm. idea that yeah. that the Jewish people were just another white group in mm -hmm. Europe and as you say it's just complete historical ignorance it's, it's not just ignorance it's it's sort of learned foolishness yeah, it's, it's yeah. a new way of seeing yeah. the world, a new person that's very recently come along and people have picked it up because they know the fashionable language and the, and the new ideological frames and and it's that it's imposed it's not just oh i just don't know anything about this it's i've learned something about it which in fact mm. is a sort of horrendous distortion well uh, the saying is a little learning is a dangerous thing <laughs> you know shall we move on from that to the story of uh, a lady who had a, a book of trans essays mm -hmm. confiscated mm -hmm. from her by Gwent police. So this lady was uh, going around town sticking up these stickers. I've got some quotes here of what was on those stickers. They said things like, no child is born in the wrong body, humans never change sex, respect women's uh, spaces, a woman equals adult human female, no men in women's prisons, mm -hmm. uh, cervix, mm -hmm. it's a woman's thing. And the police uh, ar arrested this lady. They received some complaints about the stickers and uh, apparently raided her home and took a book of essays, acad an academic book of, of essays on trans issues edited mm. by two academics. Um, and they confiscated this from her. They took her to a police station. She was released on bail at 3.30 in the morning. Her phone had been seized. She was disabled in a mobility scooter and made her own way home, apparently. Mm. Um, so I guess this leads us to ask the question, which is some, a point that Harry Miller, um, who I'm sure everybody is aware of, made, and he said that, that this suggests that the police are out of control. Do you think the police are out of control? Well, you know, I, the problem is also they're stuck within a regulatory framework where they feel like they don't know what else to do. 
So what's really happening is activists are complaining. Now, okay, this is, this is an activist herself making provocative comments in public, but then particular activists are seeing that and complaining to the police, knowing that the police kind of have to act under the equality frameworks that they're set up yeah. with. Mm -hmm. And then the police are following that and, and going through all this process. So the question is, is it the police or is it just something about what they're now caught in that then they feel like they have to behave in this way that seems completely baffling to us. I, mm -hmm. I mean, it does remind me of Harry Miller, because of course, the problem with what happened to him was that like, the police were ringing him up after he made some provocative tweet and saying, well, we need to check your thinking. Again, this mm -hmm. cap taking away of a book suggests that they're trying to sort of get inside mm -hmm. the thought process behind the, the, the stickers or whatever, which just seems mm -hmm. uh, an extraordinary overextension. It suggests that the police now believe that they have the power to decide what is legitimate to have on your bookshelf, even if that, even if that literature is not illegal. And again, going back to the Harry Miller case, the whole point about non-crime hate incidents is that these things are not crimes. And so sure. again, this is the police interfering with something that it is evidently nothing to do with what, criminal behaviour. But what happened with Harry Miller recently, you know, is a great, a great victory over the recording of non-crime hate incidents. Yeah. It was a real problem. Mm -hmm. And that's an example of where you really do need legal recourse to sort out the general problem. These specific cases happen because of much more general situations or structures within the legal framework that the police are following. And we can get lost in the individual cases and forget that we need to look at the, the Equality Act or, mm -hmm. or something around the policing guidelines where these problems are actually set up. Well, that's what, that was um, Harry Miller's case largely, which was that yeah. the uh, College of Policing Guidelines, uh, he managed to uh, get the uh, a decision that they were in fact unlawful, you know, in, in recording these non-crime mm -hmm. hate incidents and indeed that they shouldn't be reported, you know, uh, and you know, kept on your records for God knows how long, so that employers could see them. There was actually another case, was there not, of a woman, and the police um, came up, this was the past couple of weeks, and sort of said, we want to know the context in which you said this, the, the, the thought process is behind this. Yeah. But I don't know whether it's, it, it's something like this, I think can be actually done out of stupidity too. I mm -hmm. mean, I think that there's nothing worse than a bit of indoctrination and a bit of thickness combined mm -hmm. and you get these kind of actions, do you not think? Do, do you think Just, to a degree this is also the police's ignorance of the law? So like when we saw yeah. the, the video of the police officer explaining to someone outside of an abortion clinic that, that them expressing their views were was essentially equivalent to assault, that mm -hmm. the police are actually no longer clear mm -hmm. on what they are supposed to be policing, what is legitimate to be policing, in the same way that the government don't seem to be entirely clear on what is a, what is legitimate government mm -hmm. activity, mm -hmm. that now we've ended up with the boundaries being so blurred that actually the police are not even, not only are they ignorant of the law, but they're not actually sure what policing is for anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the question that incidents like this make me think about is what do you do about it? How yeah, do you yeah. fight back against a problem with, like this? And one of the problems is this is a form of asymmetric warfare. Conservatives, people on the right, don't really like making complaints. Like They don't yeah. do the equivalent of the left-wing protesters yeah. of complaining to the police and pushing that thing. So you're not going to be able to fight it in the same way. But what you can do, perhaps, is work out what the legal issues are, clarify them, make sure that the police are properly trained, and get the law reformed when it needs to be. Those seem to be like sort of good places to tackle this problem in a way that the right has some sort of ability mm -hmm. to do. Yes, uh, I think that you can't, uh, unfortunately you can't underestimate, as you say, the legal framework. Mm -hmm. I say one of the big problems with all of this is that subjectivity has now come mm -hmm. into the law in a big way. Mm -hmm. uh, it was never subjective. Now it is sort of almost about what the victim perceives, what the victim feels. Mm -hmm. Even the use of the word victim you know, I mean, it, you should actually use the word complainant if you're going to be completely correct. If you use the word victim, you've more or less decided it, haven't you, already? You know, what mm -hmm, the situation mm -hmm. is. Well, and, and it's sort of the hierarchy of, of people's ability to be offended or who you have to yeah. be most careful of. And, you mm. know, I mean, these are difficult issues, but it's part of, part of what's pushing the, the, the police response is a, is a concern that people who are in the trans community are much more sensitive or, or suffering with mental health issues. And... But these are, these are sort of issues of truth and fact that need mm. to be properly established and investigated, not just sort of taken on trust. How, um, how do you, you know, if, if the issue is subjectivism mm. in the law, and I mean, we've seen it in the Scottish hate crime bill, um, there are other proposals in, in Northern Ireland, elsewhere, mm. in the Law Commission, mm -hmm. this, the, the sort of pervasive subjectivism is obviously a problem for law enforcement. You can't have a fair and just legal system when there is so much based on the subjective perception of particular people who are offended. Mm. 
how do you how do you combat that? Is there a way that you can combat that, given how deeply entrenched that already is within legislation? Well, no, you have to change the definition, don't you? You, you have to get rid of that subjective. It's not enough to say it's, it's the victim in the victim's view. It's just not. It's just, I could sort of, I could decide that what you just said to me there is offensive, mm -hmm. right? And I could go off and they would probably put it down as a stat and all of that, mm -hmm. it would stay there for a while. That's, that's what's got to change. It's got to be somehow we've got to, we have got to reestablish the objective criteria. Mm -hmm. I think so. And, and certain activist groups have worked out how to use these gaps in the law, these sort of yeah. weaknesses in yeah. the way that it's framed and yeah. turn them into a way to get what they want, even when they're actually very, very small minorities of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and how do you fight against that? Well, you've got to change the, 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 the loopholes yeah. that they're, they're making use of. Yeah. And there's another aspect to this as well, which I think connects in a way, back to the Whoopi Goldberg discussion yeah. about around double standards and um, inconsistencies in the thinking of particular parts of the left, which is that from the perspective of the lady who was doing this, as well as from the perspective of, you know, a number of women who have taken the same approach to transgender issues, they get referred to as gender critical feminists, people like JK Rowling, you know, that these are feminist issues. These are not, as, as this lady said herself, she's not you know, trying to attack trans people, she's trying to protect women, she's trying to protect sex-based rights. These women mm. are concerned about women's issues and women's safety. And it's not, be, it, I mean, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, um, it was reported that in California, a 26-year-old trans uh, sex offender had been sentenced to, so uh, male to female sex offender, um, had been sentenced to two years in a juvenile institution um, which just seems absolutely mad. This is somebody mm -hmm. who had assaulted a 10 year old girl being sentenced to two years in a juvenile institution. You know, there are people have legitimate concerns around women's safety. And so I guess the question here is also, you know, what, you know, what has happened to feminism, third wave feminism, but what has happened to that entire um, segment of the left that they are no longer able to see that these women are not doing anything other than the old school, you know, fighting for women's rights. Well, you know, we were talking earlier about subjectivism, but I think part of what the problem is here is, is the big problem with identity politics, which is, you know, the loss of individualism. What you see here is two different identity groups sort of fighting for mm -hmm. power. And this happens to be, you know, women and feminists versus the trans community. Yeah. And, uh, that sort of fight because the power now lies in victimhood and groups of, of victims. Whereas, you know, the, the, the older way of seeing things is thinking about people as actual individuals, not as a sort of cluster of, of ranked uh, mm -hmm. victim statuses. And unless we can get back to some form of individualism in, in law and in how we treat people, I think we're always going to have problems. And it's just we see this very clearly mm -hmm. in this particular sort of duel. Do you think individualism is the solution? I think, I think uh, yes, it is on a kind of uh, philosophical level. Uh, that's not to diminish it. But I think that what, you know, what is clear from these stories is that the whole structure is riddled with this stuff. This, the institutions, you wrote a book about it, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the institutions are riddled with, so, you know, what is a court doing making that kind of decision about that person mm -hmm. in America? How does that happen? You, you could say it's the influence of feminism or, or third wave feminists, or, or whatever, or woke or whatever. But somehow, these, these people are are actually making the decisions. Mm -hmm. Or the police, same thing. And this is the frightening thing because I don't know about you, but sometimes, and people I think feel this, feel this, is that we're sort of sitting here watching this all go on, you know, and this is a sense of powerlessness people have. Mm -hmm. How come this this kind of crazy stuff is happening? How many more times can we complain about it? Mm -hmm. You know what's going to happen? But this is the thing. Well, this is the thing, and the, but of course, this is unfortunately what my book is about in, in yeah. many ways is the fact that, you know, the culture war is, I think, in many ways lost. And that's a very hard yeah. thing to hear because then you have to accept, oh, that's that's right. We, we have actually lost. We are sitting in a landscape where the victors are the other side and this new world of identity politics. And you're trying to work out how to resist or how to exist within a sort of occupied landscape. It isn't a battle that's still being fought. It's really been, been won by the other side, and that's the conditions we now have to adapt to and work out how to survive and 
and fight back and but it, it, it's a long road when you're in that situation. How much do you think this has to do with, I mean, we're talking about subjectivism, but the death of reason that, you know, you, with the court in California, that we've become so unmoored from reason, partly because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these authors who, you know, people like Robin DiAngelo, it's an explicit attack on mm. reason, on in, in the enlightenment, on the things that moor us to objectivity. And once you lose that, you don't, you, it, you know, the playing field is completely different. You you can't engage in, in, in the ways that we are familiar with. And so it's very difficult to um, to, to tackle these sorts yeah. of things because mm. they've become completely slippery. Mm. There's nothing to tackle them with because there are no tools available. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you sort of get caught in a paradigm. It's not entirely a lack of reason, although they are often suspicious of reason that's sort of in, enlightenment as being sort of coded white and, and, and mm. with the power structures and so on. But they're stuck within a way of thinking about the world and what the causes of oppression are and the inequalities in the world. And therefore that, that leads them down through a process of reason to the, the only thing we m must do is tear the whole thing down mm -hmm. and you know the whole society is just riddled with, with dysfunction and, and discrimination and, mm -hmm. and white supremacy. And so that, that's the, the, the path they're stuck on. It's very hard mm -hmm. to argue with that because it's it's like seeing the sun going around the earth or not or the earth going around the sun you know just you're stuck within one paradigm and how do you how do you talk to the other side the thing is though, Sean, it's you know i tend to the view that you know this is uh it's nihilistic because there's no kind of alternative offered you know to tear down the tear down the basic sense of who we are men and women tear down this tear down that destroy basically um but what do we put in this place? Um, so, you know, you then have to sort of say, what well, is it in fact a form of communism that they want? This is what some, you know, is it a form of, because cultural Marxism, that term, which is a bit controversial, I think, but it's, it's used, isn't it, often as mm -hmm. a way of describing what's happening. I know. think it is a form of cultural communism, if you like, because we all sort of got inoculated in the Blair years, the, the left got inoculated against the idea of equality of economic outcomes, right? They, yeah. people, people kind of understood that that didn't really work. It led you down a sort of pathway to poverty and misery. But seeking equality of cultural outcomes, of social outcomes for identity groups it is now what is in power and people are trying to do that. But it's the same problem. If you try and do that, you're going to build this oppressive bureaucracy of control. Mm. Uh, that is very unjust and, and you know, it isn't good for anyone. This mm. leads nicely onto the next subject, and especially because you mentioned the Equality Act, because in this case, this is probably a violation of the Equality Act, I imagine. Um, this story is a, is, a, is a real zinger. This is, this is real clown world stuff. Um, in a nightclub in East London, um, a company called uh, Pussy Palace, but spelt with an X, so Puxy, Puxy Palace, um, held an event that was apparently um, themed around, quote, celebrating you and your relationship with the universe. Um, the Facebook oh, event I'll said, give me a break. Really? the Facebook event said that it was a space that, this is a quote again, prioritizes women with an X, Womixen, uh, and femmes of colour and other queer intersex and trans people of colour. Now, the reason why this story was in the news is because they were charging different rates according to people's uh, intersectional um, intersectional mm. credentials. Mm. And so, um, they interesting, they use, they use the phrase BIPOC, which is the American phrase, black, indigenous, people of colour. Uh, even though obviously indigenous here does not mean the same as indigenous in the United States. Um, so they were charging BIPOC only queer women, trans and non-binary £16.80 to enter. The same price for BIPOC only queer cisgender men. Allies, which are defined as white, trans and queer slash straight BIPOC women, were charged £22.40. It's very specific. It's almost as if they've got mm. some kind of sliding scale here. But they were charging straight cisgendered, I think, white men, although it doesn't say so here, um, uh, £112 to enter. Well, that's more or less the same as saying, don't come, isn't it? Well, so the, the, idea, <laughs> the idea came from, um, uh, it was a vegan cafe in Australia, which uh, quite appropriately is now closed down, um, which was charging 18% more 
to uh, men for guests who were coming to get coffee because it was supposed to reflect the gender pay gap. And there was also a pharmacy in Manhattan who were also charging men more, a pharmacy, for, so presumably charging men more to get their medication. Um, to reflect the gender pay gap. So what that suggests is that the reason why they're doing this scaling of the prices is because they believe that the people who are in that lower category, which I think is quite offensive, will be earning less. Um, so the question is, is this a violation of the Equality Act? If you think the Equality Act is a good or a bad <laughs> thing, um, but also this is exactly as you were just describing the, um, you know, the the, the structure of the hierarchy. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think you know it sort of inverts that, that old saying of Gandhi's of uh, basically first we laugh at them and then they win, right? This is this is something that seems mm -hmm. very silly, but I think it is a cultural trend that mm. this is right, right at the cutting edge of the culture, right? This is a sort of sexually permissive, young, cool culture and clubbing isn't you know for my generation these these are, these are young kids come back in 20 years these things could well have moved into much more powerful places in the culture and you see these things at the edge of it they turn up later so even though this in itself i mean it's just a sort of silly fun story but it may be a sign of of things to come well isn't it uh, basically it's more it's the triumph of equity exactly. over equality that basically equality of outcome Regardless, you've got to have equality of So This is actually a very pure example mm. of it, isn't mm. it. We can't fix the other supposed gender pay gap, if you believe there is one. Mm -hmm. um, so what we'll do is enforce it at the other end yeah. mm -hmm. by, well, think, you know, charging more for it. Th I think in this case, it wasn't so much about the pay gap as just probably people that they thought were relatively poorer, but they were just trying to sort of favour the ones that they were saying the evening is for, so therefore mm. the, the others were getting left out. Although they are slightly hoist by their own petard and perhaps by the law. Because I think what they've done is say, well, we aren't going to enforce this, because obviously that would involve telling you who you identify as. So mm -hmm. in fact, you could just turn up and say, well, I'm in the cheap group. Please. I think they did actually say that, that people could identify as whatever group they, yeah, yeah. they fancied. Can you tell me what cis actually... Uh means literally cis, cis. Uh, cis is uh why cis? A, it's essentially a way of um of uh unnormalizing being uh the gender yeah, the yeah. gender that you were bought the gender that you were born into the sex that you are yeah. nat your natal sex yeah. so they 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 want that to not be normalized no i know what it all means but why the word cis where does that come from I think it does have some old derivation, like I think they used to use it, like, was it cis, cisalpine Gaul or transalpine Gaul? It does have some obscure, <laughs> it, I mean, but, but it's not, not really part of normal language, no, but... Uh, no, uh, but the thing is, is that what kind of, I mean, what kind of guy is going to turn up at that anyway? And what self-respecting straight guy is going to turn up at that anyway? Well, yeah, I'm sure. someone who's got a point to make. Well, so an ally, you say like an ally. Well, that is one of the categories. If you're going to this club and you're not an ally, then I think it's pretty questionable why you would go. It's not actually it's not actually the night nightclub that did this. To be fair, on the nightclub, it was this this um, organisation, I suppose it is, right. that put this on called Pussy Palace, Puxy Palace. Well, I think you should know pretty much what you're getting by the way in which they've mm -hmm. spelt women and all of that. You you, you should have an idea of what. They're. I think I'm not you know uh, belittling that point because I think you're absolutely right. People laughed at this thing. Oh. You think of the things that people laughed at now, which are absolutely normal, everyday stuff, uh, because, you know, it's been just, you know, brought in and it's now become ingrained. Mm. So, you know, th this idea of equality, equity by mm -hmm. all means is just obviously actually, the way we are if you If you think that, if you imagine, you know, going back to the 2010s, if you had fallen into a coma in the t in 2010 and yeah. you woke up now, the, the in vast difference, even things like, you know, spelling of woman with an x mm -hmm. it's talk of equity instead of equality as this kind of like sleight of hand that has occurred so much has changed and it's been so um uh difficult to detect while it was happening but when you look back over the last 10 years mm -hmm. we've come such a, a a long long way that these are these are not small things um the idea that that a, a company would think that they could get away with this kind of overt discrimination on the basis of your mm. sexuality, your uh, your colour, your mm. your gender, or you know, well, sex. It's all about no, it's the power thing. It's purely power. Mm -hmm. it's in, you can't. It's like uh, they, they say that uh, uh, white uh, you, white people um, are racist 
black people can't be racist because white people hold the power. So therefore, it's 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 always going to be unequal. It's exactly the same with this kind of thing, really. It's that essentially men in this art, you know, men hold power. So basically, it is quite okay for them to be discriminated against mm -hmm. in this way. You know, I um, mean, this you say this is a insidious. Mm -hmm. You talk about ten years ago. I mean, uh, you know, why in the press, for example? Why does the media talk about equity? Why is it taking it on board so quickly? Why does it now mm -hmm. just write in terms of equity? It, well, it, it is the new moral fashion, and I think yeah. we could do, you know, culture wars are long wars. People need to think on that sort of level of how you fight these things over yeah. very long periods of time. And there was a vast movement and some very big organizations that created the, the fight back against the idea of equality of economic outcome and really took that away and made it about economic opportunities instead. Mm -hmm. That hasn't happened yet with this, and we really need people who are thinking about that very hard and building the institutions that fight back, or in 20, 30 years' time. And why have you just given them a new, a new term there, equinomic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, equinomic. Equitable economics. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> don't say it too loudly, they might start <laughs> using it. Um, but I think, I mean, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's a small thing that, you know, the, the, the way that these ideas have, 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 have seeped so deeply into every aspect of our society it's mm. been so imperceptible and um, by such such incremental little steps that I think when you when you do look back on I mean even a couple of years ago mm. and if you go through you know in the morning go through the the newspaper stories some of them are so utterly bonkers mm -hmm. that you, it's 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 difficult to you know believe that we've ended up in in such a, a, a mad situation but they're not written in a kind of isn't this bonkers type way actually no that's exactly what is so yeah. bonkers about yeah. it is mm. that it's the language itself has changed mm. that now we when we talk about equality people are speaking in the language of equity it's no longer equality it's the opposite mm. Mm. um and it's the it's the it's orwellian newspeak yeah. in many mm. ways actually speaking of which all 1984 got a trigger warning on it did you um, see? This is one of the stories. This is this is exactly one of the I've stories. I've handed it to you. Then. Isn't that? I mean, that's beyond. It's, it's, these cliches no longer really work, do they? I mean, but you know, one would say it's beyond parody, beyond satire. Nineteen eighty-four has had a warning that some of the material in it might be, what, not exactly harmful but offensive. What the, what is the warning on it? Or what, there is a kind of warning, isn't there now? I, I mean, they do, they put some kind of trigger warning on it. They've put mm. trigger warnings on all sorts of things. Obviously, yes. people. I mean, people have tried been trying to cancel Orwell anyway. It's not the first story mm. of its kind. But you know, this is this is exactly what I mean. Is that you read these stories and you think, you know, Whoopi Goldberg is is coming out on American television, uh, and uh, essentially it's a kind of Holocaust denial. Um, we have books being confiscated by the police. We have mm. people being told to check their thinking. Mm. Um, we have Orwell having trigger warnings put on his work with no sense of self-awareness whatsoever. Um, and we have people spelling woman with a, with an X and, and charging white straight men more to enter clubs by hundreds of pounds than their, you know, um, ethnic minority trans mm, gay mm, counterparts. Mm. Um, it is so far removed from where we were a decade ago that I, I think that many people will be wondering where we'll be in a decade's time if this kind of thing mm -hmm. continues without it being laughed at i guess maybe maybe laughing at it is the only way to uh, i don't i mean that might help to sort of you know get, get you through but it doesn't necessarily change it as i say i think you know the trends go in a certain direction unless people also think and has that have that sort of long-term thinking about how you counteract it and, and how you change the culture i think the problem is yeah is that uh okay you yes you say you can laugh at it you know crazy old world etc um i find it very hard to do that actually now i can't laugh i mean even though I'm at the other end of life as opposed to very young. Uh, and you should be able to say, oh, well, you know, the world, get on with it sort of thing. And I, f I just can't because it offends my sense of reason. I find it offends my own intelligence, actually. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the worrying things, you know, you say what would be like in 10 years' time, um, and discussing this recently with Toby Young, you know, from the Free Speech Union, uh, is that young people, according to surveys, young people really don't 
care, for example, very much about free speech. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, the this, concept. this is why it's going to be much worse in 10, yeah. 20 years' time. There's a sort of cohort effect. The generations that are coming through in the universities and just in general don't, aren't, aren't really worried about these issues at all. And, of course, they're brought up on them in ways that we weren't. Um, so, you know, the, the natural course of events is definitely going to go towards, you know, a, a much less uh, open and free culture in that yeah. sense. On that note, the elephant in the room is the political aspect of this, mm -hmm. because obviously with pretty much everything that's been in the news has been Partygate, Partygate, Partygate for mm -hmm. weeks mm -hmm. and weeks, and it probably will be for weeks and weeks to come. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there are political implications of the things that we've been discussing, but also the politics matters to the, you know, where these things end up. Um, what do you think is going to happen with the Conservative Party? Do you think that Boris has got away by the skin of his teeth or do you think that it's just a stay of execution and that ultimately he's done for? And if so, what, what are the implications of that for the Conservative it Party? It seems to me he sort of limps on like a sort of wounded animal <laughs> covered in cake. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, sort of with everyone laughing at him and unable to do anything very interesting and perhaps not really wanting to anyway, which is, you know, the worst of all possible worlds. Mm. And if someone like David Frost were, were running the show or even Dominic Cummings, dare I say, who actually had visions of, you know, alternative vision of what you might do in government, something interesting uh, might happen. But as it is, I mean, he'll, he'll throw the odd bit of red meat for two seconds if he thinks he'll get him a good headline. But he's not going to pursue things over the sort of the time and with the long time horizons yeah. that really have the ambition to make a difference. And you won't have the, the authority or the power to do it. Well, in fact, they did throw a few bits of red meat. And the, 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 the odd thing about today's politics is that they sort of quite consciously do it and describe that this mm -hmm. is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's no, you know, there's no sort of like attempt at analysis. Analysis is not needed. It's just like we're throwing them some red meat about the BBC, and I think it was immigration that little one. Um, do they have that much contempt for us that they just think this? We're going to sort of think, oh, that's okay then, you know. Um, and if it's that easy to do, why didn't you do it before? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the other thing. But I think um, with Boris, um, my perception is is. And actually, that's another thing. Sorry, Boris. We keep calling him Boris. It's too affectionate. Uh, you know, this is stuck. This branding. I find myself saying Boris, Boris. You know, it's too. We never said Margaret. <laughs> no one ever said Margaret. It was always Mrs. Thatcher or Thatcher. Uh, but I, I think that we were more adult then. That's because we took her seriously. But it's now. I think it's, it's, Johnson might open him up to jokes. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, Johnson. It might be. But Boris is just like this fun hoo hoo figure. Um, but uh, the thing is, uh, he, I get the feeling he'll kind of, he's already limping out the other side. I could be wrong because I don't watch 24 hour rolling news, but so therefore my perception is probably he'll survive this. The Tory party though is another question altogether. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not even remotely conservative. Well, that, that's an, another aspect of it is that, or the discussion has been who would replace him. Um, and well, the all, only good candidate seems to be Steve Baker, but that seems extremely unlikely. Most people don't even know who he is. Mm. I'm sorry, but outside of this, this sphere, uh, they don't know who he is. That's a big, uh, that's very important uh, mm -hmm. that people know who you are. I mean, and they the don't other, even know who Liz Truss is. No, they don't. If you look at the surveys, they no. know who Rishi is. But yeah. that, that's it. Yeah. They, they, they don't know who they are. What do you think long term the implications would be if the result of this was just a crashing electoral defeat and you know, they do terribly in the May elections, the Conservative Party starts plummeting into terminal decline as a result. Do you think that that's what's going to happen from Partygate? Because, I mean, another question would be whether or not Partygate is a, is a kind of media concocted scandal and that the public are paying so much attention to it because the media have made it into this enormous thing and that otherwise perhaps the public wouldn't care so much. Do you think this is going to have a knock on effect on their because they seem to be recovering slightly in the polls. Party affiliation is extraordinarily robust. That's one of the reasons why the most effective thing you can do is really is sort of take over a party structure for a different way of thinking, which, of course, Margaret yeah. Thatcher did and Tony Blair did in, in different ways. Yeah. Um, but who is there and who's got an actual vision to take over the Conservative Party and actually make something interesting of it? I mean, you know, Cummings was trying and you could argue that Frost and Baker have a, a vision somewhere and if they got some power or behind the right candidate, perhaps they could do it. But I don't see anyone. I think, you know, possibly Peter Hitchens is kind of 
on the right track here. You know, he's been saying for ages, the, the only thing that's going to save any kind of conservatism in this country is if the Conservative Party goes, right? Mm -hmm. So he would say abstain, don't, don't for it. If they have a big defeat, then maybe there'll be a space open for a proper Conservative Party. Maybe, you know, but maybe it might, it will take that. I don't think election results really count for much. I think it'll be mm -hmm. the next, next election. Do you think that those who are predicting that people will vote, sort of protest vote for either the Lib Dems or reform in the Red Wall, do you think that that's something that, you know, might result from this? In by-elections, maybe. I think in a general election, you have to wait and see, you know. I mean, people don't, this is probably, look, I mean, however much one agrees or disagrees with reform or reclaim, just look at the result. <laughs> The results that have been, you know, the past few elections, it's just minimal, mm -hmm. you know, it's minimal. Yeah, but uh, the Brexit Party, UKIP, did have quite a lot of power on, on shifting Conservative policy. Oh, huge, so the ability, yeah. if you can find a sort of protest party that can do that, then that's another way to shift the party from slightly from outside. I couldn't agree um, more. That would probably involve someone like Farage, I don't know who yeah. else has the, yeah. the, the muscle to do it. That's the only, the only way. Uh, UKIP, obviously I was in UKIP, UKIP and then the Brexit Party. Uh, enormously effective actually at doing what they were meant to do which was being an elected pressure group in a way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they were an elected but no one really cared what they thought about economic policy or that it was about the referendum it's about the eu if you had some group like that on the issues that we've been talking about today uh, then that could really start to mm -hmm. the tories need to be made frightened that's the thing they frightened only of their losing their seats. And if they see if something coming up on 15% or 20%, then they might start actually thinking, oh, you know, which is what Cameron did with Brexit. How mm. plausible do you think that is, though? Well, well UKIP happened, I guess. I mean, it mm -hmm. the thing is, you're talking about what? It, te it was founded in 93, mm -hmm. so you an idea of how long. So a long time long to wait. Long time, long time to wait. <laughs> I mean, you know, you might have lost all interest in politics. Then, <laughs> I imagine you know? I will have. I'll be dead. <laughs> you know? Culture wars are long wars. And, yes. and it's, you know, you've got to, you've got to hold on to that fact. It's, yeah. That's the only way uh, to go about it. Actually, there's one thing I want to ask, Mark, before, because I think we were about to end. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I was about to end on the note of you saying you were going to die. But... <laughs> no, 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 I want to ask, Mark. You read that book uh, two years ago, mm. right? But you actually wrote it without us knowing, right before a massive cultural onslaught. Yeah. With yeah. all the, I mean, does it, is it changed? Would you write it differently now? Well, the, the bit that's most out of date is the bit at the end where I'm optimistic about what Boris might <laughs> <laughs> do to reform things. Although I think some of those things could still be done, but just obviously yeah. not by Boris. So, uh, okay. you know, if, if someone wants a blueprint for what to do with their with their rival pressure party. Right. Okay. <laughs> On that note, by the blueprint. <laughs> Thank you for joining us and we will see you next time. Thanks. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.